Hello, Curran here. This video is going to be about axes. Axes, like the X and the Y axes, give meaning to space. So what am I going to discuss? Uh, we're going to add tick marks. We're going to add axis labels. Uh, we're going to discuss some theming approaches. So you could have, you know, custom font size and font color and also responsiveness so that when the visualization resizes, ticks should appear and disappear depending on the space available. What I'm going to do next is start from this responsive margin convention example that we created in the previous video. I'm going to fork this. I'll change the title to responsive axes and I'll update the description too. Then I'll rearrange the code to be on the left and the running program on the right with the DevTools open. And then, okay, what do we want to do from here? From here, what I'd like to do is give this thing some axes. So what we're going to do is, you know, reduce the size of this uh, rectangle so that we have space for axes. And then just add some axes and uh, see where that takes us. Typically, axes appear on the left and on the bottom. So I'm going to increase the left margin, and also I'll increase the bottom margin. We can start by saying g.call d3.axis left. And let's actually call this our y axis. Let's pass a new instance of d3.scale linear into our axis. And let's call that scale y scale. In order for a scale to make sense and be meaningful, it needs to have a domain and a range. The domain of the scale is in, uh, I like to think of it as data space. It's the space of numbers that it's mapping from. And then the range of the scale is in pixel coordinates. And so in our case, we want the range to go from zero to inner height. And boom, we've got this axis, see that? What we're seeing here is the default range of d3.scale linear that goes from zero to one. We can make that more explicit by setting the domain ourselves. There is one problem here, and this is a mistake I make almost every time, and that is that it goes from the top to the bottom, but really, typically, what we want is for the numbers to increase from the bottom to the top. So what do we have to do here? It turns out that we've got the range reversed. So we need to reverse these and say, okay, the range goes from inner height to zero. This is because Y coordinates start at zero at the top and go up as you go down the screen. There is sort of a big problem here because when we call the axis, it gets rid of our rectangle, right? So if I comment that out, the rectangle's there. And if I uncomment that, the rectangle disappears. And I think this is because that the D3 axis code uh, clears out whatever is there in this group element. So the solution is we can add a new group element just for the Y axis. That way things won't interfere. Instead of g.call, we can make it y-axis-g.call. We can say let y-axis-g equals g.selectall-g.data null, same pattern we used before. Then we can reassign y-axis-g to be the merged enter and update selection. Ta-da! We've got our rectangle back. Okay, now let's move on to create the x-axis. All right, the x scale is going to be a linear scale, same thing, domain from 0 to 1, and the range is going to go from 0 to inner width. The x range doesn't need to be flipped because the lower values we want to appear on this side and the higher values we want to appear on this side. And uh, as the x coordinates increase, we move from left to right. Then our x-axis is going to be an instance of d3.axis bottom, and we can pass in our x-scale. 
we can create an x-axis group with the same pattern, copy paste that, and just change y to x all over the place. Then we can call it with x axis g dot call x axis. Okay, well, something happened here. Uh, we've got a couple problems, though. We've got two problems here. The first problem is that our y axis disappeared, and the second problem is that our x axis is on the top, not the bottom. The reason why the y axis disappeared is because when we say select all G here, we actually end up picking up the group element appended here, which is intended to be for the Y axis, but it gets reused for the X axis. So how can we solve this? We can use classes to differentiate these two. We can say, okay, G dot select all dot Y dash axis then when we append the new group, we can give it a class of y-axis. Same thing for the x-axis. We can say select all dot x-axis, and then we can give it that class when the group element gets created. All right, we solved problem number one. We've got both axes being rendered. Now let's move this x-axis to the bottom where it should be. To solve this, we can apply a transform to the x-axis group element that translates it zero pixels in the x-direction and inner height pixels down in the y-direction. All right, now it works. We've got our x-axis on the bottom. So we've added the core essence of axes, which is tick marks. Next up, let's add axis labels because, you know, Tick marks are useless if you don't know what they mean. The idea is that in this space here, we can add a label that uh, tells us what this axis means. We can go about this by adding a text element onto our x-axis G and then putting it in the right place. So we can say const x-axis label is x-axis G dot select all text dot data, an array with a single element, and then again use the general update pattern, enter dot append text dot merge x-axis label, and then we can set the text content of this text element to be, say, x. And indeed, check it out, there's a little x right there. But it looks like it sort of overwrote the first of our tick labels, which is not good. If we inspect the DOM here, we can see that each of these tick marks in the axis is in its own group element. And then inside of each of these group elements, there's a tick line and then also a text element. And if we look at the first tick, the text says X. That's from our code. What's happening here is when we say dot select all text, it's actually picking up these tick mark text elements that are appended by the x-axis call right here. So again, we can solve this using classes to be a more specific selector. Instead of selecting all text, we can select all dot axis dash label. And then when we append this text element, we can give it a class of axis dash label. It should be there, but I'm not seeing anything. So let me inspect the DOM and see what we see. Okay, there's a text element there, and it looks like it should be in the right position, but we're not seeing it. Why is that? My guess is we need to set the fill color of this text. If we set the fill color to be black, then lo and behold, it shows up. There it is, our little X. And if we change the text to say x-axis, you can see how it behaves. It looks like it's centered here. The next step is to move this so that it's over here in the center of the x-axis and offset a little bit. To center it horizontally, we can set the x attribute to be inner width divided by two. And then to move it down a little bit, we can set the y attribute to be, say, 50. 
All right, there's our x-axis label. Now let's do the same thing for our y-axis. I'm gonna copy paste that whole block and then change x to y all over the place. We can change x to be, say, negative 50 because that's the offset it should be from the y-axis. To center it vertically, we can set the y attribute to be inner height divided by 2. All right, that pretty much works. There's our y-axis label. If the y-axis label gets too long, typically we need to rotate this 90 degrees. To do this, we can set the transform attribute to rotate by some number of degrees. But if we change that, see how it's actually rotating around something that we don't want it to rotate around. So let's set x and y to 0 and then rotate it again. It looks like the rotation that we want here is minus 90 degrees. But now if we change x, it actually moves up and down uh, because we're translating by x in the rotated uh, space. Now to center it vertically, we need x to be minus inner height divided by 2. To offset it horizontally, we need y to be minus 50. All right, that's how you can rotate the y-axis label. And I'd say now we have a fairly solid representation of the x-axis and the y-axis labels. The next thing I'd like to discuss is theming. Notice how we've got these arbitrary values like the fill is black and the y offset is minus 50. Semantic UI, one of my favorite uh, UI libraries, has this beautiful dogma which is everything arbitrary is mutable. I think that's like one of the coolest philosophies. Um, and I sort of envision a world where there's visualizations that are themable and everything arbitrary is mutable or rather configurable by you, the visualization author. So let's sort of uh, try to take a step in that direction. One common way to solve this sort of thing is to use CSS because we have classes that we could sort of hook onto. But I'm going to opt to do this differently and to do it all in JavaScript so that uh, you can sort of componentize these things and even do something like change the theme dynamically. And then you could do things like package up a theme as a, as a JavaScript object and uh, you know, swap it out really easily. And so if you wanted to theme a visualization, you wouldn't need to copy-paste a bunch of CSS as part of your process. Let's start by addressing this arbitrary fill color of black. Instead of black, this could be a variable y-axis label fill. While we're unpacking our props, we can unpack y-axis label fill too. And uh, if it's not specified, we could use a default value of black. What I'd like to do next is establish a theme object that we can pass into here. At the top of this code, let's create a variable called myTheme, which can be an object that in the beginning just has y-axis label fill set to gray. The effect we'd like to achieve is to pass in y-axis label fill as gray into this props object that we pass into my responsive component. We could say something like y-axis label fill is my theme dot y-axis label fill, and that works. See, now it's gray. Ideally, we would not need to repeat everything here and here. You know, ideally we could just take everything that's in my theme and add it to this object that we're passing in. We can do this by using object.assign, which is built into JavaScript. Object.assign mutates the first argument, so that's why I'm passing in this empty object. 
Then it assigns all values from my theme to this empty object. And then it assigns all values from this object to that object here that already has values from my theme. This means that it will use the value from my theme, but if you wanted to, you could override the value here and say, I don't want gray, I want green. This could be useful if, say, the theme is externally defined and you want to overwrite just a couple things. All right, so we've established the overall structure for our theming. Now let's go through the exercise of making everything arbitrary mutable. The next arbitrary thing I see is the x-axis label fill, where we could apply the same approach and give it a default value while unpacking and also add it to our theme. All right, now our x-axis is gray too. The next arbitrary thing is the y-axis label offset and also the x-axis label offset. We can unpack these from the props as well and give them default values of, say, 50. We can add these to our theme as well. And somehow I just like x to come first, x, y, x, y. Now we're in a position to go the other way and say, okay, if we can theme this thing, what kind of things do we want to theme? And the first thing I can see here is that like everything is tiny, you can hardly read it. So why don't we go about adding some things to the theme like the size of the tick marks and the size of the labels. Let's set up x-axis tick font size to be 16 pixels and the same for the y-axis. We can unpack these from the props. Then after we call the y-axis, which sets up the ticks and the tick labels, then we can select all something, I don't know quite yet what that's gonna be, and then we can set the font size to be x-axis tick font size. I'll comment that out and inspect the DOM to see what we need to select. Okay, great, each one of these group elements has a class of tick and we want to select the text element inside of the tick group. So we can say select all dot tick text. And we can do the same thing for the x-axis. So we've got x-axis tick font size applied to the x-axis. That means I think before I used x where it should have been y. Yeah, this should be y. So let's double check if it's working, if it's propagating from our theme. If we change the font size for the X axis, indeed it applies to the X axis. And it works for the Y axis too, sweet. Now let's set up X axis label font size and also Y axis label font size. We unpack these from the props then we can set the font size style on our y-axis label and for the x-axis label too. Alright, looks like it's working. These are bigger now than they were. I'm noticing a slight problem which is we're setting the fill in the enter selection. That means it'll only get set on the first invocation. So if it so happens that the fill color is changed in between invocations, it won't update. So I'm just going to fix that by moving it into the merged enter and update selection. I'll test this setup a little bit by tweaking some of these things and trying to make it look just right. Another arbitrary thing where we're just using the default right now is the fill color of the tick marks. We can introduce a theme property called x-axis tick font fill, set it to light gray, and same for y. We unpack these from the props too. Where we are already selecting the tick text, we can set the fill attribute to y-axis tick font fill. And we can do the same for x. 
We can follow a similar process for the tick line fill, or actually, because they're lines, we need to st set the color using stroke instead. So I'll say, okay, the tick line stroke for the x-axis and the y-axis. As you can see, this exercise of trying to theme axes quickly turns into this rabbit hole of infinite possibilities of things that you may want to tweak at some time, which uh, I'm going to try to cut off and just cover, you know, 95% of all cases. So I think the last thing that I want to make tweakable for now is the domain line, which is this black line that goes along the center of the axis. So let's call it x-axis domain line stroke, and we'll set it to gray for now. And same thing for y. And we can unpack these from the props. And we can say y-axis g dot select something, uh, and then set the stroke of that to be y-axis domain line stroke. But how do we get that domain line? If we inspect the DOM, we can see, okay, there's a path that has a class of domain. So if we select by dot domain, we can see that, okay, now it's working. Our domain line is gray. We can use the same pattern for the x-axis. All right, that's pretty much how you can make themed axes. I want to do two more things before we move on to dealing with responsiveness and the first is to use better colors based on a well-known style guide and the second thing is I want to clean up this code a little bit so that our labeled axis logic is separate from this uh, visualization itself. The Sunlight Foundation data visualization style guide is so good for referencing colors and one of my favorite sections is this section on base colors it recommends that okay this color is good for main text this color is good for light text and this color is good for lines so what I'm gonna do is copy this hex code for the text main color and then use it in our theme yeah I like that I like how that text looks it has a punch to it but it's not black, it's not too high contrast. Next, I'm going to take this text light hex code and use that for our tick mark text. All right, now our tick marks are a little bit more readable, I'd say. Lastly, I'm going to use this line gray accent color for our lines. All right, sweet. Now our colors are informed by this super duper uh, style guide. Next, I'm going to clean up the code a little bit. One thing I'm not so happy about is that we're defining these default values here but we're also in a way defining the default values in the theme because they could be overwritten here in this object that you pass in. I'm going to change it so that this code assumes that there are values defined on the theme object when it gets passed in. The next thing I would like to do is isolate this logic for the axes from our myResponsiveComponent function. This code here defines the y-axis, and then this code, in addition, defines the y-axis label. So I'm going to cut that code, and in its place, I'll call a function called labeled y-axis, and pass in the group element, and an empty object for now as the props object. We can stub out a function called labeled y-axis that takes as input a selection and props. Then I'll paste that code into here. The first thing I notice that we need is the y-scale. So we can unpack that from our props in labeled y-axis. And we can pass in y-scale on our props when we invoke that function. Next, I'll create an expression that unpacks all the props that start with y-axis. 
then I'll remove those y-axis props from the unpacking expression in our myResponsiveComponent code. Then we can move that expression that unpacks the props for the labeled y-axis into the labeled y-axis function and also unpack the y-scale alongside those other props. We want to make sure that these props get passed into this function. To do this, we can use object.assign, just like we did before, to essentially pass through all the props, but also add y-scale as a new prop. Let's see, what's going wrong here? Why isn't this working? Oh, g is not defined. Right. So we need to use selection instead of g. All right, it's working just fine. Look at that, it's sweet. So let's do the same thing for the x-axis now. We can cut that logic for the x-axis and in its place call a function called labeled x-axis with that same object that assign pattern. We create a function called labeled x-axis that takes selection and props and paste all that logic into there. We isolate the expression that unpacks the x-axis props. Then we use that in our labeled x-axis function with the addition of x-scale. Again, we need to use selection instead of g right here. Let's see, what's going wrong? g is not defined. Is that fresh? Oh, I think it's inner height. We're using inner height, but we're not uh, passing it in. So let's pass in inner height as well in our props. Yeah, when we call it, we can pass in inner height. And boom, there it is. It's working, all right. All right, we pretty much covered theming. Next, let's talk about, last but not least, responsiveness. So I'll open this in full screen mode and I want you to take a look at these tick marks as I resize this. So see how the density changes. The number of tick marks remains fixed and if it gets too small they start to overlap with one another which is the main problem that we're going to try to address right now. But how can we solve this problem? I propose we use density-based ticks, where the number of tick marks that we ask for from D3 axis is based on, you know, the number of ticks per pixel or pixels per tick uh, that we want. And that this will be the behavior that we're sort of going after in this demo here. The way this works is we've got X pixels per tick and then we're requesting the number of tick marks to be some varying width divided by x pixels per tick. So let's apply this technique in our code. To me, this feels like it should be part of the theme so we can add x axis tick density and same for y. In our labeled x axis function, we can unpack that from our props. Then on our D3 axis, we can say dot ticks, inner width divided by X axis tick density. And we don't have inner width, so we need to add that to our props when we unpack them and when we pass them in. Now when you resize this, see how there's a fewer number of ticks when it's small, but if you make it large, there is a lot of ticks. This is exactly what we're going for. Next, we can do the same for our labeled y-axis function. We can unpack y-axis tick density from the props. And on our axis, say dot ticks, inner height divided by y-axis tick density. And also, we don't have inner height available, so we need to add that to our props when we unpack it and also pass it in 
when we call labeled y-axis. Now if we view this thing in uh, full screen mode, and we resize it vertically, you can see that the number of ticks is density based. So now our axes are responsive in both X and Y. All right, so we've covered all the topics of axes, namely tick marks, axis labels, theming, and responsiveness. You could stop watching here, but I'm gonna do one extra step, and that is to take advantage of the DataViz Tech platform and make these labeled axes into a technology that many visualizations could use. And also, the theme could be a technology. So if you were to, you know, fork a visualization, you could easily change the theme by forking the theme and making your own theme. What I'm going to do next is create a technology that encapsulates this, uh, these labeled axes components. So I can click on Create Technology in a new tab. I'll call it Labeled Axes and then hit Create. I'll describe it as Reusable Components for Labeled X and Y Axes. Then over in our visualization, I'm going to select the logic for the labeled x-axis and labeled y-axis and cut it out of here. Then paste it into this labeled axes tech document technology. Then I'll fix the indentation. Then I'll load it into our visualization code over here by going to the references section and saying add I'll type in labeled axes, there it is we can call it labeled axes.js now in our visualization code we can say okay a new script tag where the source is labeled axes.js and lo and behold it still works Next, I'll go through a similar process for the theme, and this will be the DataViz Tech theme, which you could, you know, fork and modify later on if you wanted to. So I'll click on Create Technology in a new tab, and I'll call it the DataViz Tech theme, and then click on Create. I'll describe it as a default theme for visualizations. Then in our visualization code, I'll copy this theme object, or cut it, rather, and then paste it into this theme technology. And I'll call it DVT theme, DataViz Tech theme. Then back in our visualization code, I can click on Add New Reference. Then I'll select the DataViz Tech theme. I'll call it dvtTheme.js and click on Add Reference. Then we can add a new script tag and say source is dvtTheme.js. Oh, something is broken. Oh, I think we're still using my theme. Yeah, so I'll just change this to DVT theme. There we go. Now it's working. One cool effect of doing it this way is that you can change the color in the theme and all visualizations that use this theme will be updated immediately. Now when you look at this visualization, it says, okay, the technologies that are used are the margin convention, labeled axes, and the DataViz Tech theme. And the code slimmed down quite a bit from what it was before. If we look at our labeled axes technology, we can see that the most arbitrary thing of all is hard-coded here. It's the text that's shown on the axis. So let's go about making this configurable. I'd like this to be a prop called x-axis label. 
Uh, but that's already taken. Okay, let's rename this x-axis label to x-axis label text so that we can use that name x-axis label as a prop. Then in our visualization we can pass in x-axis label is say x space axis. And see so you can change it here and it updates so it looks like it's working. Let's also pass in y-axis label as my y-axis. See it doesn't update yet. We can unpack y-axis label from our labeled y-axis function. We can rename our existing variable to y-axis label text and set the text content to be the value of the prop y-axis label. Alright, now it says my y-axis and uh, we can change it back and see it's updating. So, hopefully this serves as a proper starting point where we can build real visualizations using this as our foundation going forward. So, thanks for watching. Take care.